we've got a very special guest, somebody I met, oh, 15, 20 years ago, she doesn't want to admit, uh, who came to me and said, hey, I've got an idea for a Commodore thing. So uh, since then, she has been really well known and uh, an inspiration to all of us. Uh, give a round of applause for Jerry Ellsworth, please. It's such an honor to be uh, introduced by Bill Hurd because uh, I look at Bill as a, uh, a mentor that's helped me throughout a lot of my uh, professional career, especially at least in the engineering side of things. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for mentors along the way that um, helped me out, you know, I couldn't have done a lot of things in my career. Um, so, I know many of you have probably heard my story again uh, before. I'm going to rehash some of this, um, but I think it's important to kind of set the stage. And I'm going to try to inject some, uh, some new stories in there, maybe. Um, Ken, uh, here, I've got one for you. But, uh, you know, it goes back to uh, I was just a weird little kid living in rural Oregon who had this insatiable desire to tear everything apart and understand why it worked. And... You know, yesterday on the panel when Fran was saying, like, she just had this insatiable desire to tear things apart, and I think some of the other panelists also said that. I think that's a common thread with a lot of us, and probably a lot of us in the room as well. And for me as a kid, you know, I would look at, you know, the toys that my father purchased for me, and it's, you know, they were fun to play with and all, but I, I just didn't like anything that felt like magic and that I couldn't understand. So... At a very early age, um, I started taking all my toys apart, and uh, much to the frustration of my father, I would, uh, you know, open the toys up most of the time, just destroying them, and uh, it uh, uh, became kind of a, a contentious uh, point in the house when I did that, and. Uh, um, but I was learning along the way, and I didn't have a lot of mentors besides my father at this point in my career or my life, but um, he was very generous. Um, he would let me go to his service station, so I got to see uh, an entrepreneur bootstrapping a business from the ground up, so he saved up, started his, his business. Um, he was a single father, raising me by himself, and... Um, he would just let me sit down in his office and I would look through the windows into the service bay and watch him wrench on things. So it's partly his fault too that he gave me the skills to ta teach me how to take things apart. So I was just mimicking him in, in a lot of ways. But I was very much a child of the late 70s and the early 80s. And so with this slide here, I'm just showing like these are the things that really, you know, inspired me as a kid. It was the middle of the space uh, shuttle program totally enamored with space. I used to sit around and dream, someday I'm gonna be an astronaut like a lot of us did. You know, and then arcades, arcades were just booming at this point. And you know, even though in the heyday of arcades I was only like this tall, I was still just in love with all of these amazing visuals that um, I was seeing on the screen. And uh, any chance I got to go into the arcade, I would just stand there and just watch people play and think, someday I could build something like this. And uh, of course, you know, things like Star Wars, you know, seeing, uh, you know, Chewbacca um, playing holographic games. I was like, yeah, someday in the future we're going to be playing with holograms. It just seemed like a given to me. I didn't know, you know, limitations of physics or any of that. Um, but really when uh, things started to gel for me as kind of getting the engineering mindset, it was when I got a chance to touch my first computer. Back then it was state of the art, it wasn't vintage like all the things we're playing with today. And that happened to be the TI-99 4A. So yeah, woo! <laughs> um, so one of uh, the, our family friends had um, dedicated a computer room. Remember when you used to dedicate an entire room to computers? And I guess maybe you still do it today, but I mean, it, it was like computers were a big investment back then, and it was like the centerpiece of their home, and we'd go over there 
and they would sit me down in front of this TI-99, and I didn't know anything about programming. I could barely read at the, this point, but I could poke in a few things into the keyboard, like draw house and hit enter, and it would say syntax error. <laughs> Paint house syntax error, but I just, I had a great time just fiddling around with it, even though I wasn't very productive, you know, programming on this um, old TI-99, and, and eventually they pulled out the manuals to it, and they're like, hey, just verbatim, you know, sit here for two hours and type in 10, poke, whatever, and uh, just fond memories of uh, programming in things like Mr. Bojangles, if any of you ever typed that in on your old TIs. Um, at this point, I was hooked. I'm like, Dad, Dad, you got to get us a computer. Please get us a computer, get us a computer. And of course, he's bootstrapping his business, and we were very, very poor at this point. And, you know, we lived on this little tiny, like, kind of amateur farm. And a lot of our food actually came from, you know, vegetables and stuff that he grew. But it, he saved up to um, buy a computer. And, uh, I think I sensed that it was coming because he would take me to the Montgomery Wards and the Sears and let me just run around the, uh, the displays there. Um, back in those days, it was amazing to go because they would have Ataris, VIC-20s, Commodore 64s, TIs, just sitting there at basic prompts, you know, and... Uh, you know, I'd go to every one of them and go, 10, print, Jerry rocks, and <laughs> go down the line, like, Dad, look, look, I'm doing it. Like, you should get a computer. <laughs> and uh, so, um, of course, I'm a snoop around the house. I, I got to spend a lot of time by myself because he's busy working. And one day, I was snooping around his room, and I opened up his closet, and I saw, well, actually, I want to go back. Um, to the Sears and Montgomery Wards. I had my eye on a computer, and I wanted it so badly. It was called the VIC-20. And the reason I wanted it so badly is because the letters were really big. And I thought big letters were really, really cool. And <laughs> anyway, fast forward like a few months or however long it took for him to uh, you know, open up a credit card enough that he could get a computer. And I, I got into his closet, and I saw... 1541 disk drive box. And then I saw Commodore 64 there. And uh, so I knew he was going to be gone for a few hours. I'd carefully pull it out, <laughs> slip it out of it, <laughs> hook it up to the TV, the two screw terminals in the back. And I, I don't know, this is probably 1984 or 85. I don't know how old I was, but I, would, I managed to get it set up. And then I, have to rush, put it back into the boxes, and then, you know, put it back in the closet. And so that went on for like a week or two. And, and, and I was actually forbidden to be in my father's room because, you know, he had guns and stuff like that, but that didn't stop me because I was a delinquent. And uh, so luckily for me, later on, I opened the room and he has it hooked up to a television there. And I was like, all right, every time I get home from school, I can be uh, playing on this thing. And in fact, I was taking the demo disc out of the, the 1541, and I was writing little programs and storing it on the last, like, 10 blocks free that it had. Um, so eventually, my father revealed the computer. It's the family computer, and it needs to be the center of our, our household and set it up on the dining room table. And, and I, uh, like... Oh my goodness, I pretended I was so surprised to see this thing. <laughs> but yeah, I was all over the Commodore 64. But again, I was uh, super curious. I, I really didn't understand how things worked at the time. And he had, I hadn't discovered this when I was snooping around his room, but he'd actually bought a couple video game cartridges, Donkey Kong and Moon Patrol. And these cartridges, you plug them in the back and you can play the game. And I was... Wow, I could do the arcade experience, you know, in the living room there. Um, but I was looking at these cartridges, and I'm super curious, and I'm looking at these gold connectors on the end, and I'm like, oh, well, it must be just wires that are making connections between all the pins. So if I make the right connections in the cartridge port, I should be able to make my own video games. So 
uh, of course, I went and got forks and knives and started jamming into the back of the cartridge slot. And uh, ended up frying a couple of these Commodore 64s that just like mysteriously stopped working. And Dad would have to go and go get it repaired or, or trade it back in. And uh, <laughs> such an idiot. <laughs> um, but I was learning. I was learning. So eventually, after frying like the second or third Commodore 64, sorry, Jack Tremiel, you know, for all of your lost um, profitability, um, my dad takes it away to get it serviced, and he comes back with a plus four, and he, he announces to me, he's like, yeah, the salesperson at the, the store said the Commodore's junk, but this plus four is far better. Uh, <laughs> no, I... It was actually, the Plus 4 was an amazing machine for me at, you know, eight years old. Um, the Commodore 64 was fun and all, but it was not a, um, accessible to, like, a young person like me. The Plus 4 was amazing because it had all these advanced basic commands. So you could put it into graphics modes. You could type in things that sounded like English, like circle and circumference, line width, whatever it was, and I could get circles to show up. It was a wonderful machine for that. So yeah, I was going headfirst into computers. Around the same time, my father, um, actually for my brother, got one of these electronic kits up here. And uh, this electronic kit was you know, amazing uh, because it was very simple to use. If you remember these, there was a book that came with it and it just had drawings of like hook wire to this spring, hook this wire over here, and you didn't have to have a tremendous amount of knowledge to make it do things that were mind-blowing for me, like make a thing that sounds like a bird chirping or an AM transmitter. Oh my goodness, I could transmit from this thing. So I ended up spending all my time, you know, using my brother never used it. Um, but that got me started, got me go heading in the right direction to understand how electronics works. And of course, home video game consoles, we didn't have a lot of those, but um, a lot of um, my friends did. So anytime I could get in front of some kind of digital you know, gaming system, I was totally hooked on it. So to fight um, the... Uh, I guess my desire to take apart all these expensive toys and computers. My father at his gas station, he had a box, and this is obviously some stock photo, photo that I got, but uh, he put a box out front on the curb that says, bring your broken electronics, and people would just bring you know, electronics and drop it into this box. And about every three or four weeks, my dad would come home with this box. It, sometimes it would have like nasty, greasy toasters in there. Other times it would have like an old tube radio, things like that. And I used to just completely decimate everything that came in this box, take every screw out. The circuit boards, I would take the, the resistors, I'd bend them back and forth and you know, break them off the board. They had no leads on them. And then I would like line them up and sort them by like the pretty colors. <laughs> and I had my, uh, I was collecting lots of little components. Um, but this, this also led to the occasional time that I would get something that either still worked or I opened it up, you know, it might be a toy or something. I found like a spring popped off or a greasy, you know, glob in there that had congealed and that's why it didn't work. And I, I started to actually take things and, and make them work again. So I was gaining more of this knowledge of like how this stuff actually worked. And that was really amazing. I uh, thanked my, my dad a thousand times for doing this. And this continued, I think, clear into my teens. My dad just continued, would gather junk for me to take apart. And it's part of the reason I'm a hoarder today. So, so it's a double-edged sword. And it was really fun too, you know, I, I started to learn how to do things like transplant a green LED into a device that had a red LED and I started to learn like, yeah, these things, you put them in one way, they don't work. Um, of course, my father was scared that um, I was going to injure myself most of my life and uh, so I really wanted a soldering iron, you know, so he had a, one of these big like Weller soldering guns, but I was not allowed to use it, and uh, which I did anyway. 
and I ended up breaking it. Um, so I found myself at one point without a soldering iron to be able to, to mess around. And so I discovered that you could take one of these AC wall transformers and a wire wound resistor and you could take some uh, wire and you could wrap around each lead and hook it up to the AC uh, outlet and plug it in. It would start glowing cherry red and you could solder with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, um, one time it like flopped off my desk and landed on the carpet and burned a big mark in the floor, which of course my dad, you know, come tuck me in at night or something came and he's like, what is that? And I had to fess up that I was soldering with like the super sketchy wire wound resistors. Um, so he eventually did, he went to Radio Shack and got me one of those chromey Radio Shack pencils, you know, and promised I wouldn't solder unless he was home, which of course I did when he wasn't home. <laughs> Juvenile delinquent. Um, <laughs> But I was always super curious, and I, you know, luckily I didn't get hurt too bad along the way. There was times, um, you know, that I did really stupid things. Um, he brought home this big uh, organizer of automotive light bulbs. I don't know where he acquired it, but uh, it had all different types of 6-volt and 12-volt light bulbs in it and showed me how to, like, stack batteries together with duct tape and to get these things to line, light up. So I really, really enjoyed that. And of course, I stacked lots of batteries together. So in the film, really fun. It's like, oh, that one turned silver inside when I burned it out. <laughs> then I got the bright idea one day, I had a desk lamp. I'm like, well, if I can make them burn out in cool ways with um, just batteries, what if I just take the lamp out of my desk lamp and tip it back and surely I can drop one of these automotive bulbs down there and make the contact. So we lived in this old house that used the old screw-in type uh, fuses. So of course, you can imagine, I drop in this automotive bulb, showers of sparks. I probably fell backwards and was trembling. And then I had to go break it to my father that, you know, somehow a fuse, <laughs> a fuse blew. And of course, my dad's not dumb. And he goes into the room and it smells like ozone. <laughs> So uh, this is a little bit older photo. Um, we had a house fire, unfortunately, and um, I lost most of the, the photos from when I was a kid. But you know, this is very much you know what my workbench always looked like—just tons and tons of junk everywhere. Did you start the house fire? <laughs> no. <laughs> I I have an alibi, <laughs> and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, right, brother. No, it actually burned down when I wasn't, in my teen years, I was actually gone and the house burned down. It was sad. But uh, uh, around the same time, I ran into one of my first mentors. So um, I was probably in my teens, early teens, and up the road was a boy that was a little bit older than me, and we got to, to know each other, and he was into electronics as well. And so he was building little AM transmitters in a very similar kit like this one at the bottom. And like, I like to transmit, you like to transmit, let's make competing radio stations. <laughs> and so uh, we get in, got into this kick for several summers where we were building first single transistor AM transmitters and we would jump on our bike and we would ride down the gravel road and we'd count the number of phone poles to see whose transmitter would go the furthest. And then he'd figure out how to put a higher power transistor in there. He'd go a little further, a little further. And it was this arms race. Um, although I need to go back and um, tell him how my, I had an extra awesome cheat. So what I did, I found that if I wound my antenna around the phone line, I would get a little extra boost. <laughs> Um, so this is back in the days, you know, talking about phones, I should talk about phones because this was back when it was five-digit dialing in our, our area, so mechanical back then, and it was a small community, like three or 4,000 people, 
So anything outside of that area was long distance. So my father didn't want me using the phone much at all, so I had to use the one up in the kitchen, one of those old rotary ones that hung on the wall. Um, but somewhere along the way, I was uh, riding my bike, and I saw down in the ditch was like a busted up you know, telephone laying in the ditch. And of course, anything electronics, I was going to grab it and take home. So I took this thing home and figured out how to get it, you know, working again. And so I secretly like ran the wires up the edge of my room, out through, down, and into the basement and hooked up to the phones. But I knew that I couldn't have the, the bells on the, this phone or he'd figure out that... Well, in fact, actually, I should back up before I tell this story. Um, I actually built my first phone with that electronics kit. So I used the Morse code key in it. If you remember a rotary dial, you know, it's making and breaking the connection. I think I used the relay or something to make and break the connection. And I would call my friends, and the, the speaker would be also where you'd listen and talk. And if you screamed really loud, people could hear you in it. And so I hated calling my friends that had zeros in their, <laughs> in their number. And uh, anyway, so this phone, yeah, so now I have a phone, and it's hidden away in my room. I'm trying to be super sneaky about it. I took the bells out of it, so you couldn't hear it ringing. Unfortunately, one day, my dad's in talking to me, and the phone starts ringing. And there's a, even though the little clacker wasn't hitting anything, there's a distinct kind of cadence to that. And uh, yeah, I was outed. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I got into a lot of phone freaking, did a lot of fun stuff around that, um, figured out this little triac circuit where I could instantly pick up the phone if someone called in, and then I could use the remote function on a tape deck and play messages back. I had my friends thoroughly convinced that I had complete control over the phone system. So I'd call them up, I'd prank them, click in this little um, recorder that would play back any message that I pre-recorded on it, and then then tell them, like, yeah, I can just disconnect phones whenever I want because I could play back, like, doo doo doot. This number has been disconnected. Um, this is also the time that I ran into um, some of my most valuable uh, mentors. These were ham radio operators that I met at the local library. So I was looking at the three books on tube electronics, the only probably electronic books in our library, and these two guys were there, and they came up to me, like, oh, you're interested in electronics? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they... Um, they took me under their wing. They took me out to their little ham shacks and you know, tried to convince me to get a ham radio license, which I had no interest in. They were completely mortified that I was doing pirate radio. And like pirate radio is so strong that we, and we got to the point where we couldn't even ride to the end of our, um, you know, in an afternoon, we couldn't ride to the end of our broadcast distance. But they, they gave me like legit like tools, oscilloscopes, Heathkit oscilloscopes and voltmeters and taught me how to solder properly, how to use your number one debug tool in electronics, which is your finger. So if something's not working, start touching it. I probably still have Moss uh, technology logos on my fingers because of that. <laughs> um, so I was a super like nice kid, you know, really like shy, uh, kids could make me cry really easily, so it became um, a game at school for all the kids to torture me. So through junior high and high school, I was um, viciously picked on. But then there was this moment in my life where I just kind of snapped one day. This kid that had been picking on me, um, I just lost it. I had a big like math book or something. I just clobbered him across the head. He was sitting in his desk, and he flipped out of his desk. And the teacher walked in just as I did this. And of course, we had this zero tolerance policy. So I initiated the fight. So I got suspended for a week. But what was, uh, what was really great, my father, he's like, did he deserve it? And I'm like, yes, he definitely deserved it. And so I didn't really get any punishment from my father, who my father, by the way, was really amazing at um, putting things in perspective for me. I'd come back and say, like, kids are so mean to me. And he would say things like, yeah, just think of it this way. If they're picking on you, they're leaving somebody else alone because you're so strong that it just rolls off of you. You know, and when you're like 14, it doesn't feel like it, but, you know, that was some wise words. Um, but when I came back to school after the suspension, all the um, bad kids were like, you're pretty cool. And so I found like the more like crazy and the more I hung out with the, the wild kids, 
the more the bullies left me alone. So I went total goth, hanging out with the stoners. So I was like going just off the rails in trouble with the police. They were hauling me home. And of course, my father's super concerned at this point, you know, and I'm in, constantly in trouble with the police. And, and at this point, I'm, I saved up and got my first car and I had all of this like freedom. And, um, but I was trying to build this like mystique of like, I'm like a badass or something. Uh, my father had done some amateur racing when I was younger, and I thought that was really cool. He had taken me to the local racetracks, and I'm like, there's nothing more badass than racing cars. So I asked my father, will you build me a race car? And he's like, hell no, you're going to like kill yourself. Uh, but I got obsessed with this, and so uh, I just became bound and determined that I was going to build a race car. And this is where another mentor came in. I went around to all the machine shops in town and asked them if I could work with them in exchange to teach me how to weld and, and machine and that I was going to build a race car. And so I found this machinist. He let me come in on the weekends. He worked me you know, to the bone, like cleaning lathes and moving metal around. But in exchange, he taught me how to like weld and machine. I started putting a race car together. Um, in his shop, and eventually my father came around, he's like, okay, I gotta get involved, so make sure you do this right, and in fact, I built my first race car, I thought I was gonna be amazing, I had this, you know, anticipation that I was gonna go out and win, you know, every race. Uh, my first race, I went out there, um, I was slowest time of the night, <laughs> by a lot, I was in the slowest heats, I spun out, crashed the first time, my first crash, I'm like, oh, that wasn't so bad. But then, uh, <laughs> but I, I progressed from there. I worked with other mentors. I actually had a book that I found that had like how to set up and configure these quarter mile dirt track cars. I started calling the guy in the back of the book and just pestering him, you know, like, hey, you know, my car is pushing. What do I do? And uh, he finally said, like, if you can get out to Florida, I'll and stay with me and my wife for two weeks. I'll teach you everything you need to know about racing cars. And that was really amazing. I went out there. I drove in a Greyhound bus for like four days or five days to get out there. Spent like the first four or five days with um, him and his wife. He taught me everything about how to set up the suspension, the cross weight, all those things you need to know. Pretty straightforward stuff. But then he spent the last week talking about the psychology of racing. And so <laughs> that served me really well going forward. And so he taught me, he's like, first you've got to get in the heads of the other opponents. So you need to make them think that you have an edge up. That way they get nervous, you know, if you're, they're in your race. Um, also, if it's not in the rule book, then it's legal. <laughs> and so uh, this led to a bunch of really interesting things. Um, of course, I'm getting pretty advanced with electronics at the time, and this one's for Ken. He wanted to hear about the traction control system. So traction control was pretty new around 1991, about when I was doing this. So I built my own traction control system. It was 6502 based. Uh, I had a little ROM and a RAM on there. Uh, wire wrapped, I'm amazed that it worked. I measured the engine RPM from my rev limiter, and then I had a hall sensor on the front wheel to measure how fast the front wheels are spinning versus the back. I had a little program that I could um, determine roughly the ratio. And if the, um, the back tire spun too much, then it would just trick the rev limiter into thinking that the engine was over revving and it would just cancel cylinders. And it was amazing, like I could just go fly into the corner, just put my foot down and I didn't have to worry about like burning the tires off and spinning out. And I just started dominating everyone. And of course, I had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit at this point, and um, I uh, uh, wanted to sell these. I was selling chassis at this point. I was building cars for other people. And in fact, I dropped out of high school because I was making so much money on the racing circuit and selling race cars. And I wanted to sell these traction control systems, which brought it to the attention of the uh, track uh, owners, who then started banning it everywhere, every racetrack I went to. And uh, this went on and on. I did a lot of different innovations. I had linear actuators moving suspension parts, and of course they banned that. Um, I think the funniest one I added was brake lights to my car, fake brake lights. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, every day you drive around and the, um, you naturally put your foot on the brake or slow down when you see the brake. Um, and this comes about because I broke open one of these kind of red-orange uh, glow sticks and tied it on the back of my car one day. 
And this guy came up to me afterwards, like really upset that he's like, I just felt like I had to hit the brakes all the time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun racing stories. Um, but it was a tough business being in the, in the racing business. It was very profitable, but, um, you know, knucklehead guys at the track, just not my thing. And so uh, a friend of mine from high school was showing me this 486 computer that he built um, that he had tricked a wholesaler into selling him components for. And he's like, yeah, this computer, I paid $600 in parts. It's normally a um, you know, $1,500 computer. I'm like, oh, that sounds a lot easier than you know, getting scars from welding or you know, traveling all over the West Coast racing cars. So I started a business with um, my friend from high school um, of course, I'm still like super gothy and like, you know, swearing like a sailor all the time. And of course, we start butting heads and he like boots me out of the business after we bootstrapped the whole, the whole thing. And so I went back, you know, asking my friends, what should I do? I hired this lawyer and booted me out of the business. And of course, my father is telling me and my friends are like, you should get your GED, go to school, do something, you know, get your life on track. And instead, you know, I'm like, screw that guy. I'm going to put him out of business, no matter what. So I went down the road. I, I moved out of my apartment. I got the deposits back. I rented this little barber shop, threw the barber chair out back, and then set up business just a few blocks away from him. Didn't have any money to put inventory in it, so I'd go to his dumpster in the middle of the night and get all the colorful boxes, put it all over the wall. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it was very much a game of Rob Peter to pay Paul in the early days. So someone would come in like, I want that sound blaster. I'm like, oh, that one's taken right now. If you give me like half down, I'll get you one in a couple days. And I started bootstrapping the business that way. But I was still really rough around the edges. Um, and thankfully, another mentor entered my life. He was an insurance salesman across the street from uh, my business. And he was just kind of a computer nut. And he felt sorry for me. He'd bring me lunch. Um, I literally was like almost maintaining zero money in my bank account at this point. I was sleeping in the back of the computer store on a cot and eating ramen noodles. And he started teaching me about relatability. He's like, you know, you may want to ditch the Doc Martens and the, uh, you know, dark eyeliner. You maybe, you know, there's a thing called relatability. You don't want to swear in front of customers. You need to kind of, you know, look the part of what, how they, um, you, you want them to perceive you. And it, that was a huge relief. I'm so thankful that he came into my life. And it's like, oh, you mean I can go back to being kind of like how I was? And wow, it was like, it was a miracle. Overnight, I just started like acting the way I really wanted to act. And like, wow, things started going gangbusters. And this was 1995 when everyone was getting on AOL and we were just selling computers like crazy, got my first employees. And um, it was amazing. I ended up opening five stores and just making more money than I could ever imagine at the time. And so this went on clear until year 2000. And it just, I, yes, Ken? Did you put your previous partner out of business? Did you put your partner out of business? Oh, yeah, he, yeah. I, the question was, did I put my partner out of business? Yes, crushed him in like a year. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be undersold. I actually would lose money to make sure I got the deal. Like someone would come in like, I want this you know, a floppy drive and, you know, this other guy down the street has it for $19. I was like, I'll do one better, $14. And that's probably the price I was paying for it. But yeah, I was out for revenge. I do have a bit of a vindictive side, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> so everything's going gangbusters. Year 2000's coming. I'm just selling computers like crazy, upgrading all these Y2K computers that were going to explode. Right after um, Y2K, the market fell apart completely. No one was buying computers. And um, we started hemorrhaging money like crazy. I had personnel, you know, keep trying to keep the lights on. Um, and this was a, an interesting thing. I, maybe I was too naive. And since I've worked in dozens of startups, and I've seen the good and bad of how leadership can uh, engage with uh, their personnel. I didn't know any better. I was just super transparent with everybody. I'm like, oh my goodness, we're nine weeks away from running out of money, we need to figure out something. And so I saw everyone rally, and I was warning people like, you know, if you really need this job, you probably should start looking now. 
And what was so heartwarming is like a couple people left, but most people rallied and we tried all kinds of things. We actually kept the, the business going for a long time. We made a network gaming center, you know, adjacent to one of the businesses it was pretty profitable until broadband came in. <laughs> it's like, oh, fuck. Uh, we sold satellite dishes and cell phones and stuff like that. And it was really heartwarming to see how everyone rallied. And uh, it got to a point where it's like, I don't see this turning around. And I went to all the folks, you know, in the in the company, I said, here's the deal. If you want the store, it's yours. Just pay me back for the inventory if you can ever turn this thing around. And uh, we, in a couple of the stores, uh, we just closed immediately because no one wanted to take it on. Three of the stores um, I gave away to the employees. Um, one of them is still in business today. So, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really, really thankful. I never got my inventory, but it's okay. <laughs> So then I came up with this crazy idea. This entire time I had the computer stores, I started working with FPGAs. I had money to get tools and great test equipment. And that was my weekends. I was just like making really fun things. I was reverse engineering like parts of old Commodores just for fun. And I'm like, I'm, oh, of course, the computer stores fail. I go to my friends and my father, what should I do? Go to school, get your GD, you know, get your life on track. That was a good, fun little run that you did. And of course, I'm stubborn. Like, well, you know, I'm doing pretty complicated stuff with electronics. I bet I can, like, get a job in Silicon Valley. So I started going to all of these events down Silicon Valley, Embedded Systems Conference, and, these, and I would go in and I'd meet all these founders of these startups, and I had this little duffel bag full of components and things that I built, circuit boards, and anyone that would listen, I'm like, hi, I'm Jerry here. You want to see my LCD controller? Which LCD controllers were kind of complicated back then. You want to hear my uh, sound generator? And I and, uh, got a lot of interviews out of that, actually. Um, people are like, wow, that's really impressive what you do, you've done. And I'm living in the Portland area. Come down and interview. And just time and time again, I would like fly down to Silicon Valley just to get a no in the interview. And it got to the point where I took on a minimum wage job at an electronic store up in uh, Salem, Oregon. She is hawking electronics. And this is kind of an interesting and funny story. Like, I'd been running my computer store. I knew how to sell things. I knew how to upsell things. And I knew electronics. So I was in this, uh, it's like a uh, Fry's electronic style store. It was called Norvac. Um, kind of like a Radio Shack on, on steroids. And so I would be there. And uh, these hobbyists would come in and they'd be buying like a bunch of transistors and a, you know, perf boards and stuff, and they'd come up to my counter and be like, oh, what you building? And they're like, tell me, and like, oh, is, is it going to be battery powered? Like, there's a great deal on battery boxes over here. What do you have for an enclosure? You know, and so these guys would walk out with like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like all this stuff, and I'm helping them like do their projects. Like, have you thought about an emitter follower for that? Or, and so it got to the point, I'm just doing this part-time, and I told the owner, like, I want to get a job in Silicon Valley, so I just want to do this a couple days a week. Well, he saw dollar signs, and uh, there was, like, a competition, like, a little chart he had on the wall, like, who could sell the most, and, like, week three, I'm just, like, psh, clear to the top. And then he started, like, you know, trying to push me to put more hours in, and I'm like, nope, I quit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Anyway, I got my first break down in Silicon Valley. Um, it was an interesting situation. So at this point, I didn't have money to fly down on, in an airplane, so I was taking the Greyhound bus again. Horrible experience, taking Greyhound. I went down to do this interview, and I go in, and this was pretty typical of the interviews for me at the time, is I'd go in, I'd start meeting parts of the team, and then they, you always want to cut an interview off early if it's, there's something wrong. And so it usually would go like this, like, oh, I'm Jerry, I got all this cool stuff, and I'm doing the shock and awe kind of stuff, showing all the circuit boards. And they're like, well, where'd you go to school? I'm like, well, actually a high school dropout. And then they would cut the interview free. This one instance, I had met the founder of the company, and he's like, come down and interview. Interviewed. They cut me off early. I'm walking down the stairs out of the building, and I ran into the founder coming back in the building. He's like, where are you going? And I'm like, oh, well, they cut the interview off. I guess it's not going to work out. And he's like, well, have you talked to this person, this person, this person? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And so he just hauled me upstairs, got the whole team together, and did a panel interview with me, and I landed the job. And I took it very serious, very, very serious. 
and uh, work day and night to make sure that their design came out really well. And that was my stepping stone into getting other, other jobs. And then from that, I got a recommendation to something else and something else, something else, and started doing a, a lot more engineering work out of Silicon Valley. And then uh, that brings me to this golden opportunity. Well, actually, there's a little bit of a side story in there. It's probably where I started running into Bill. Um, I had this harebrained idea to make a C1 reconfigurable computer. So FPGAs, quite small at the time, they didn't have a lot of density, but these FPGAs let you emulate what a, a full custom ASIC can do, usually not at the same speeds, but they're completely reconfigurable, so you just basically work in, in the, the gateware that goes into them. And so I'd been just on the side reverse engineering the Commodore 64 to stick it into FPGAs, and I'm like, now I'll just make a computer that an ATX form factor computer where people can just download their own FPGA emulations into it and started working on this design. And I think that's when I reached out to Bill. Somehow I ran into him and I'm like, hey, I'm having trouble with this sprite logic. It's just not quite working. And of course, Bill has done a lot of FPGAs. He just sent over a piece of code. I'm like, oh, that's it. And it was really amazing. Um, but then Somehow that was out on the internet, and there's this toy company that approached me, and they're like, we want to do a Commodore 64 on a joystick, um, but we've been trying to emulate it with the Nintendo on a chip, and it just, we can't do it. And we hear that you have reverse engineered the Commodore 64. Can you make a custom chip for us? And of course, at this point, I've done FPGAs and simple things. I'd never done a custom chip, so I, I took a big gulp and said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, can you get it done in a year? Yeah, no problem. And so uh, uh, many of you know Robin 8-Bit Show and Tell. Um, that's where I, I got introduced to Robin. Uh, him and his team were working on uh, getting the software ready for it. And meanwhile, I was scrambling to figure out how to, to make a Commodore 64 on a chip, having never done you know, a, a custom chip before. And... Uh, it was pretty tight and hairy um, schedule for us. Uh, we actually didn't have color on the FPGA prototype until two weeks before we were doing the final tape out of the chip. And then we were behind schedule at this point to where we couldn't even do test chips. So they just had to do a hot lot where that means they just push all the wafers through the, um, the foundry. And this led to all kinds of interesting situations. The, uh, the, the chips went off to China to be bonded on the circuit boards and go into the pilot run. Uh, next thing I know, I'm getting this phone call from this really angry executive, um, like screaming and swearing, like these did not work, you lost me millions of dollars, you need to jump on a plane, go solve this problem. And I'm like, this is like the biggest oops moment of my career. I was like debating like maybe I should go to hide in Mexico or something <laughs> because uh, the magnitudes of the money and the, the goof up was, you know, huge. But I decided to like, you know, go to China and take a look at this thing. I get there and so they bring out the, the prototype or actually part of the pilot run and they open it up for me and I take a look at the circuit board and I'm like, this isn't the circuit board that I sent over to you guys. They're like, no, we cost reduced it. <laughs> I, like, wh what? And then, of course, again, going back to my mentors, the first thing I do is I took my finger and put on the circuit board and bloop, ready. I'm like, oh, thank God the chip works. Oh, my God. Um, we quickly spun the circuit board, put all the capacitors that they cost reduced out of it back onto the board. But then it gets more complicated than that. So... Um, Robin and a bunch of the folks working on the software, they're passionate about Commodore 64, so they added extra games to it. I'm passionate about hardware, so I added test features where you could hook disk drives and keyboards up to and turn it to a full Commodore 64. So I'm at the factory, and I drop into this secret menu that has all the instructions on how to open your device up, plus all these games, which are very sketchy, in there, and one of the toy folks sees this, and they're like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, we added a few things. And they're like, what? Show me now what that is. <laughs> and uh, so on that, uh, uh, <laughs> so I was so naive at the time. I didn't even realize, like, the, there's a rating for toys for certain ages, and there's, like, pictures of, I think, it, <laughs> was it us drinking beer with you or Chuck Peddle? I can't remember. 
but we're drinking beer or something, you know, in one of the pictures we embedded in. They're like, we can't sell it to kids now. Like, you cannot tell anyone about this. <laughs> so I get home. I'm, I'm telling a friend of mine about this. And like, oh, and they said, you're done in the toy industry. You're done after this. I'm like, okay, well, I'm done. And one of my friends is like, well, if you're done, why don't we just let the world know about it? <laughs> so he put together a fake blog, which was supposedly this Chinese worker that likes to hack on toys and back. <laughs> and then the last entry was, you know, here's this great toy I'm working on, the DTV, like leaking the whole thing to the world at this point. And somehow he got it on the front of Slashdot. Yeah. So now I'm getting phone calls like, we are suing you. We know this is you. And I'm like, uh, no, not me, not me. Anyway, it went viral. Uh, they sold out instantly on these things. <laughs> What's so funny is I'm still friends with this executive today. And um, <laughs> when they sold out in like a week or so, he, he called me up, total change of tune. He's like, <laughs> so, still today, he's like, he calls me kiddo. He's like, way to go, kiddo. <laughs> anyway, I went on to do a bunch of toys. Uh, arcade machine, I worked on like Bratz laptops and Bratz Spanish PDA. It was really fun working in the toy industry. Um, in recent years, I got to work on uh, navigation systems for rockets. This was super fun. A friend of mine, the CEO of Astra, like uh, the person doing the navigation system rage quit, and he's like, can you make a flight computer for me? I'm like, took a gulp and said, yep, let's do it. <laughs> and so uh, put together a navigation system. We made it to space with this. Um, then I got to uh, uh, this really golden opportunity to work at Valve Software, their big video game company out of Seattle. Um, they were under threat of not being able to sell games on Windows when uh, Windows 8 was coming out. And so the founder hired me. He discovered me through my YouTube channel. He's like, you're the right person to run the hardware lab that I want to put together. And so he hired me. He's like, this is your mission. I want you to bring the entire family together to play games. You've got you know, kids that love playing hardcore games. You've got casual players that are playing Candy Crush. You've got people that played games in the 80s that don't play games anymore. And you have people that have never played games. And he's like, I believe that there's some technology out there that can get everyone entertained on games. And it was an amazing opportunity. Um, so uh, I took the job. We put together a dream team. It was really cool. I recruited people from all over the world, brought them in. And we started fundamental research on how can we like, make games so accessible that you know, grandma, grandpa, and the grandkids can all play together. And so we started researching just everything under the sun. We were hooking electrodes to people's heads, running that into the director of games to, you know, you know can we amplify variable reward by their emotional state? And we were looking at pupil dilation. We had AR and VR systems. We had weird um, haptics, and we were hooking Peltier coolers up to people to heat and cool them to see if the games would be more fun. You know, what's the right input that anybody... Um, uh, would relate to. And so that's where I got the bug for augmented reality and leads to um, a couple adventures since then. You know, we built a very simple augmented reality system, you know, out of materials that were available. It cost millions of dollars. I say simple, but it was primitive, I should say. But it showed the potential. And we found that people were just squatting on our multiplayer AR systems, like the dumbest games they would just sit there and play for hours because it turned the game into more of a social experience. And this is where I started you know, understanding this uh, situation we're all in right now, um, which is uh, alone together. Like we have our single screens or we have our single player video games. We might be together, but we're very alone. And this is, for me, you know, not really... Um, how I like to live my life. I like to like connect with people, like events like this, like it's so special. And we're just getting sucked into these highly optimized systems that just keep us doom scrolling forever. Well, anyway, things went sideways at Valve. It's a complicated story. I don't have time for that. It's a very political place, but um, it all boils down to the situation where the entire AR team got uh, laid off in one swoop. And so, 
I had developed this optical technique when I was there. It was a total accident. I had actually put an optical component in backwards into this AR headset I was trying to design and actually emitted light out of the headset and out into the room. One of my colleagues had this special reflective material called a retro reflector. And I saw this beautiful image 30 feet away from me, like vivid, drew blacks, and all these things we we're trying to solve for. And then immediately I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then went back to trying to, to solve like what we think of real AR glasses. And then one day I was at home and I'm like, well, geez, this makes sense. Like maybe if I just turn the problem inside out, we can have a really great experience. And so we had developed this into prototypes and then um, I get laid off. And so they have a rule at Valve Software, whoever hires you lays you off, which is I think really cool actually. So Gabe Newell, the founder of the company, is the one that lays me off. And so I couldn't believe that he'd uprooted my life and brought me there and I was just gonna give him like a one-two when I uh, went up to receive the news. And so I walk in the door and I'm, I try to be like all puffed up and aggressive and then immediately drop into tears. <laughs> oh, I can't believe you're killing this project. It's so good. And, oh. and uh, anyway, it was, we went through the pleasantries with the lawyers that were in the room and whatnot. And then as I was walking out the door, I just turned to him, you should just sell it to me. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I, oh. So I ended up buying this entire technology for $100. <laughs> And so that leads, I have eight minutes, so we'll see if I can get through this story of um, how I face planted about a $20 million startup, <laughs> and then how I bought it all back again. <laughs> and so I left Valve Software, I had this prototype, a group of us got together, we're all laid off, we started this company, it was called Cast AR. Um, now this is my first company that I'm going to found myself. I'm super scared. And I'm like, I've never run a venture back company before. I've run computer stores, but I've never run it. And so I got scared. And so instead of just leading the company myself and being the CEO of the company, I thought I had to go out and hire a CEO and, you know, all of these leaders for the company. And coming out of Valve Software, and there was a lot of hype, man, I, we landed a $15 million investment immediately. And um, I went and got all these executives on board. And the first folks that I brought on were quite good. They were kind of scrappy startup folks. We're starting to get some momentum. We're getting the system working. And then I found out when you're in venture capital, you're working with venture capitalists, there's good ones and bad ones. And so this particular um, investor is a moonshot person. So every plan that our CEO came up with was not big enough. It's got to be a moonshot. Like, how do you sell two million of these the first month? And it ended up driving out my CEO. And then once that my CEO was out and off the board, it was me against the investors on the board of directors. And then in came the Disney executives, the Zanga executives, the Sony executives. And before I know it, Boom, they burned through $15 million, rebranding the company like five times. So the company changed names like five times and never released. We never, all the focus was taken off of making the product good and getting the product actually working. It was more about like pumping the egos of these you know, executives. And then of course they burned through all the money, but we have this dream team of all these Disney executives. So more money gets infused from the investors and they just crater the whole thing. It's like, boom. To about $20 million crater in the ground. And so, of course, when the company goes out of business, I'm sitting by myself, and Amy has a picture of this, actually, the last day, I'm just crying. I'm just heartbroken, ripped away from me again. And um, I get a call from Nolan Bushnell out of nowhere. Like, I pick up my phone, and it's like, hey, Jerry, it's Nolan. <laughs> Nolan who? Nolan Bushnell, we met at a show, like, whatever. And he's like, love what you're doing. I saw it. I saw a prototype of it. It's going to change the world. Like, you know, coming from someone that's messed up a lot of businesses, I just want to give you one piece of advice. <laughs> Sorry, Nolan, if you hear this. But that's what you told me. <laughs> he's like, there's always a way. 
And he's like, you should be the leader of the company. And I'm like, is that true? Yeah, I get off the phone with Nolan, and I start reaching out to my mentors in Silicon Valley. And I, I, I wish I could mention all the mentors out there. And I start talking to my mentors. You know, is it possible after blowing a $20 million hole in the ground to like do a startup again? They're like, oh no, in Silicon Valley, everyone's like blown hundreds of millions, 20 millions, nothing. It's like, you know. Just think of the lessons you've learned. And I'm like, I did learn a lot of lessons. I, sh I should have been running the show. And so I called up all the best people in the company. I'm like, do you want to really make this thing happen? And my, I started to form the founding team. Amy's here, my co-founder, Jamie. And uh, the, it was really heartwarming. The universal response was like, you should lead the company. You should be CEO. You should drive the vision. And uh, we ended up pooling our money, and we bought the technology again. Oh, my God. This is the last time. I'm not buying it again. I swear to God. <laughs> but we stayed focused. This time, you know, some of the things that were problem with Cast AR is they were chasing after every single market under the sun. It was going to be data visualization, medical imaging, video games, board games, this and that. And no one in the company could tell you what the company was actually doing. And so what we did different this time is, like, we are going to do one audience that we understand. It's video games on the table and group gaming together. And so that's what we focused on. We started shipping our product uh, last September. Feedback's been wonderful. It's really fun. It's extremely fun when you play together. This is what the system looks like. It's super lightweight glasses. It just has all these benefits over all the other AR systems. Wide field of view, light, low cost. Um, it can read like physical objects on the table. You can put your hands in and touch things. You, it has a magic wand that lets you poke things, which is funny. A lot of people like jeer at this wand. Um, they're like, it looks like a barbecue lighter. And it's like, <laughs> like, yeah, we tried probably 50 different shapes in the barbecue lighter. I can hand it to anybody and say, pull the trigger and poke something. And it's super relatable. This is kind of what it looks like. These have been. Ones on the left have been shot through the glasses, and it really is magical. I have a kit here, so maybe tomorrow if I find a spot, I'll set it up. Um, it's really collaborative and fun, um, and it's been going well. It's, I shouldn't have been scared, really. I hadn't been scared any time in my life prior, and um, running the business myself, I just lean on my mentors you know, to help me figure out all the new lingo for being a CEO, and in fact, uh, one of my mentors, he told me when we first started this, she, he's like, you're CEO now. Do you know what CEO stands for? I'm like, I know what CEO stands for. And he's like, I don't think you do. It stands for cash extraction officer. <laughs> so that's all I get to do is I raise money and promote the product. I don't, don't get to do too much fun stuff on the engineering side anymore, although I do get weekends. I absolutely adore programming the system. We have amazing tools. So if you're interested in playing around in like volumetric AR space, we have drag and drop tools that just let you get going like immediately without having to even do a single line of code. Um, last minute here, I just want to, since we're a very nerdy crowd, I want to show you what a retro reflector looks like. This is the special surface you roll out on your table and it redirects the um, light back at you. So it's millions and millions of little spheres that are embedded in this um, substrate. These actually get embedded. They're completely chrome on all sides. But um, once they get embedded in the adhesive, then they get an acid wash that takes the chrome off the top side, and they are chromed on the back side. And this allows the light to enter each one of these little lenses and return back to each user. And so that's the magic. And it gives us the ability to to solve what's called virgins of combination in the, uh, the system. It just basically means when your eyes focus at different depths, the, all the virtual objects are at the correct depth. And that's one of the biggest issues in VR and AR. If everything's focused at infinity, you get headaches from it. And so you don't get that with our system. All right, I have one minute. Any super fast questions? <laughs> no. All right, I guess not. No, no, no time. <laughs> <laughs>